This is the VOA Special English Health Report. The United Nations is seeking to improve electronic communication for health workers in Africa. Workers in rural areas would have a better way to get training, information, and advice from doctors hundreds or even thousands of kilometers away. In 2005, the World Health Assembly passed a resolution urging countries to plan for e-health services. The idea is to look for ways to use modern information and communications technologies to strengthen health systems. The World Health Organization says Africa is behind other parts of the world in treating HIV-AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. So, the United Nations Economic and Social Council is supporting the expansion of telecommunications technology for healthcare workers. Telemedicine is another term for e-health. Stenar Pedersen is the director of the Norwegian Center for Telemedicine at the University Hospital of North Norway. Dr. Pedersen is working with the WHO. He recently met with West African health officials in the Ghanaian capital, Accra. He says the technology can provide easier access to medical specialists and make it easier for people to seek medical information themselves. Elias Sori is the Director General of Health Services in Ghana. He says eHealth will offer a way to reduce the effects of health worker shortages and make it easier to train existing workers. Dr. Sori says the technology will also make it easier for doctors at Ghana's main teaching hospital to share their knowledge. Dr. Sori said this would help doctors in villages with difficult cases. They would be able to link up easily with a top doctor in the hospital to get advice. He also said that there is always new medical information but it is not necessary for all doctors to go to the teaching hospital to be trained and increase their knowledge. He said e-health can bridge that gap. And medical education is one of the most important parts of e-health. Services must be shaped to fit each country's health care needs and level of technological development. Another issue is patient privacy. The hope is that health ministries will together develop policies on collecting and storing electronic health information about individuals. And that's the VOA Special English Health Report. Transcripts, MP3s, and archives of our reports can be found at voaspecialenglish.com, where you can also post comments. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. We all know that some people do not seem as emotionally strong as others when life gets difficult. But why is that? A study published in 2003 in the journal Science offered an answer. The study followed almost 850 people from birth through age 26. Researchers found that those with a short version of a certain gene were more likely to get depressed after a sad or difficult experience. They found that people with the normal length of the gene 
we're better able to deal with problems. The gene is a transporter of serotonin, a brain chemical involved with mood and desire for food. The 2003 study captured attention among mental health professionals and popular culture. In fact, Science Magazine recognized the discovery of genes for mental illness as the number two breakthrough of the year. The winner was observations about mysteries of the universe. In June, however, other researchers published findings of a large new study. They reported finding no link between the serotonin transporter gene and the risk of depression. The findings appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Neil Reich is director of the University of California, San Francisco Institute for Human Genetics and a leader of the new study. He says the earlier study gained so much recognition, it became fixed in many people's minds as true. The National Institute of Mental Health and Kaiser Permanente Northern California also took part in the latest study. The researchers used information from 14 studies involving more than 14,000 patients. The scientists examined the data using the same measures as the 2003 study. They found that the risk of depression was not higher among those with the shorter gene. But they also found that stressful events themselves did appear to increase the risk for depression. Neuroscientist Avshalom Caspi, then at King's College London, led the 2003 study. He is now at Duke University in North Carolina. He has criticized the new study as incomplete. He says it ignores evidence that supports the original research. Peter Zandi is a genetic researcher at Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health in Maryland. He agrees that this latest study is not the final word. He said, after many years of trying to figure out what is going on with the genetic cause of depression, we're still not there yet. And that's the VOA Special English Health Report. For more health news, go to voaspecialenglish.com. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. The International Red Cross Movement grew out of a major battle in the unification of Italy. The Battle of Solferino took place 150 years ago in June of 1859. Volunteers from Red Cross and Red Crescent societies around the world gathered in Solferino to mark the anniversary. About 8,000 people marched in a torchlit event called a fiaccolata. They followed in the footsteps of those who took injured soldiers from Solferino to the nearest village, Castiglione. Hannington Segrina, National Youth President of the Ugandan Red Cross Society, says the visit made him want to work harder to help people. He said he is going back to Uganda to work for humanity. He said when young people come together, they have the possibility of doing whatever it takes to make the world a better place. In the battle, 
Allied French and Sardinian troops defeated the Austrian army. Around 6,000 men were killed, and more than 30,000 were wounded. Yet, says Swiss historian François Bouillon, the battle lasted only 12 hours. He says a Swiss businessman named Henri Dunant was horrified by what he saw. Thousands of wounded were brought to the next town of Castiglione. There was almost no medical assistance. Mr. Dunant saw thousands of men suffering from very deep wounds and left to die without any real assistance. Mr. Bouillon says Henri Dunant quickly took action. The businessman got local women to provide food and water. He also got them to dress the wounds of soldiers without concern for their nationality. Mr. Dunant later wrote a book called A Memory of Solferino. In it, he launched two ideas. One was the idea of voluntary relief societies to provide assistance to the wounded or other people. This led to the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement. The second idea was a treaty protecting the wounded and medical personnel on the field of battle. This, explains historian Francois Bouillon, is the origin of the Geneva Conventions. Stephen Ryan is the communications officer for youth and volunteers at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. He says it is important to get young people involved in volunteer work at an early age. He says young people need to be given the chance to feel like they are making a difference in the world. And that's the VOA Special English Health Report. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. The United States government might place new restrictions on a commonly used painkiller. Taking too much acetaminophen can cause liver damage and even death. In July, a group of experts advised the Food and Drug Administration that the drug needs more controls and better directions for use. Acetaminophen, also called paracetamol, is found in Tylenol, Excedrin, and other products that do not require a doctor's prescription. These products are used for pain, fever, colds, and sleeplessness. Their easy availability is part of the problem. People can accidentally take too much acetaminophen if they take several medicines that all contain it. The experts recommended reducing the largest non-prescription dose of acetaminophen from 1,000 milligrams. They said that is too much. They said adults should not take more than 650 milligrams at a time. The experts also said people should take less than 4,000 milligrams of acetaminophen in a single day. Acetaminophen overdose is a leading cause of liver damage in the United States. Researchers say it resulted in 56,000 emergency room visits a year during the 1990s. There were almost 460 deaths a year from liver failure. The committee was especially concerned about prescription drugs that combine acetaminophen with stronger painkillers. 
the experts recommended banding combination drugs like Percocet and Vicodin. Still, the experts were divided in their votes. The agency is not required to follow the advice of its committees, but generally does. Acetaminophen is valued as a pain and fever reducer for adults and children. It does not cause stomach problems or bleeding like aspirin, ibuprofen, and some other competing drugs can. But experts say taking even small amounts over the recommended dose can cause liver damage. Some people suffer harm from smaller amounts than others. Alcohol use with acetaminophen is especially bad for the liver. Signs of liver injury include nausea, vomiting, and a lack of energy. But these may not develop for two or three days after an overdose, too late to prevent damage. People should ask a health professional about drug combinations that could be harmful. And they should make sure they know what is in the medicines they take and how much of each drug is safe to take. And that's the VOA Special English Health Report. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. Cardiovascular disease is the world's leading cause of death. It includes heart attack, stroke, and high blood pressure. Over the years, researchers have identified several substances in the blood that can serve as what they call cardiac biomarkers. These are used to measure the presence and development of cardiovascular disease. Researchers have increasingly tried to use these biomarkers to identify people who are at high risk of developing heart disease. But a new study has found that they offer little help in this way. A team from Massachusetts General Hospital and Sweden's Lund University studied how effective the biomarkers are as predictors. Thomas Wang at the Mass General Heart Center was the senior author of the study. Dr. Wang said that even after measuring those additional biomarkers, they were not able to fully understand who was more likely to develop heart disease. Dr. Wang says they did identify some combinations of biomarkers that improved predictions of heart attacks and strokes. He said it is possible that in certain patients, measuring these biomarkers would be helpful. But for the majority of patients, having the information of the biomarker probably would not make a difference. Dr. Wang hopes future research will discover biomarkers that are better able to predict the risk of cardiovascular disease. But for now, he says, doctors should depend on traditional risk factors. These include a history of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, tobacco use, diabetes, obesity, physical inactivity, or poor nutrition. A separate study found no support for a theory that a biomarker called C-reactive protein causes heart disease. Earlier research suggested that the more of the protein in people's blood, 
the more likely they are to develop heart disease. The new study confirmed a link, but did not find evidence that the C-reactive protein causes the disease. Both studies appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association. The World Health Organization estimates that cardiovascular disease killed 17 and a half million people in 2005. That was 30% of all deaths. Eight out of 10 deaths were in low and middle income countries. At current growth rates, the WHO expects the number to reach 20 million by 2015. And that's the VOA Special English Health Report. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. Picture a huge public gathering, a sea of people, like the Hajj to Mecca, or an appearance by the Pope. Think of the World Cup, the Olympics, a political event, or a rock concert. When thousands or even millions of people get together, what do you suppose is the biggest health concern? Traditionally, doctors and public health officials were most concerned about the spread of infectious diseases, like influenza. Robert Steffen, a researcher in Switzerland, says infectious diseases are still a concern. But he says injuries and hot weather are bigger threats at so-called mass gatherings. Mr. Steffen is a professor of travel medicine at the University of Zurich. He is the lead author of one of several new papers about health problems at mass gatherings in the journal Lancet, Infectious Diseases. Professor Steffen says children and older people have the highest risk of injury or other health problems at these events. He says children are more at risk of getting crushed in stampedes, while older people are at higher risk from extreme heat. Stampedes and cases of crushing at mass gatherings have caused an estimated 7,000 deaths over the past 30 years. The design of an area can play a part. There may be narrow passages or other choke points that too many people try to use at once. Professor Steffen says the mood of a crowd can also play a part. For instance, if fireworks are suddenly launched within a football stadium, people can get scared and try to escape. He says organizers of large gatherings need to avoid creating conditions that might lead to panic, stampedes, and heat stroke. And he says they must be ready to give medical care. So what advice does he have for people attending a large gathering? First, get any needed vaccinations before traveling. Then, stay away from any large mass of people as much as possible. Also, be careful with alcohol and drugs, which can increase the risk of injuries. And that's the VOA Special English Health Report. Available at voaspecialenglish.com with MP3s, PDF files for e-readers, and podcasts. You could also find our programs on iTunes. Have you ever been in a huge crowd and worried about your safety? Or did you feel fine? 
post a comment on our website and tell us about your experience. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Frasuti. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. People who stop smoking often replace cigarettes with food. A new study says the weight they gain may increase their diabetes risk in the short term. Type 2 diabetes is common in people who eat too much and exercise too little and those with a family history of it. Smoking is another risk factor. But quitting smoking may carry a temporary risk. The study found that smokers who quit had a 70% increased risk of developing diabetes in the first six years. That was compared to those who had never smoked. The risks were highest in the first three years and the risk returned to normal after 10 years of not smoking. The researchers say weight gain is probably to blame for the increase. But they say smokers should stop anyway, and the real message is not to even start. Type 2 diabetes interferes with the body's use of insulin. The substance produced by the pancreas normally lowers blood sugar during and after eating. Over time, high blood sugar can lead to blindness, kidney failure, heart disease, and nerve damage. The study is from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. It appears in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Another American study says obesity has become as great a threat to quality of life as smoking. It compared losses in what are called quality-adjusted life years. The study found that losses from obesity are now equal to, if not greater than, those from smoking. These days, there are fewer smokers in the country but more people who are extremely overweight. The findings are based on questions about health-related quality of life in government telephone surveys. The study is from Columbia University and the City College of New York. It appears in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. And another study has linked each hour of watching television daily to an 18% increased risk of death from heart disease. The study of adults in Australia also found an increased risk of death from other causes. The findings are published in Circulation, Journal of the American Heart Association. Lead author David Dunstan at the Baker IDI Heart and Diabetes Institute in Victoria says the body was designed to move. He says even if people have a healthy body weight, sitting for long periods of time still has an unhealthy influence on blood sugar and blood fat. And that's the VOA Special English Health Report. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. Hospitals not only treat infections, they can also cause them. In the United States alone, the number of infections in hospitals is estimated at close to 2 million each year about 100,000 patients die. A new government report notes that very little progress has been made in reducing what are called healthcare-associated infections. 
the most common are infections of the urinary tract, surgical site, and bloodstream. Many infections have been increasing even as hospitals have made efforts to improve. The report showed, for example, an 8% increase in cases of sepsis, or bloodstream infection, following operations. About 40% of all healthcare-associated infections are linked to the use of catheters. A tube is placed inside the body to collect urine, so the patient does not have to get out of bed. But the latest report says urinary tract infections after surgery increased more than three and a half percent. It says catheters should be used only if necessary. Another way to prevent infections is to give patients antibiotics before surgery. Doctors are advised to give them within the hour before the operation. Patients who get antibiotics earlier than one hour are more likely to get an infected surgical wound. Also, doctors are advised to discontinue the antibiotics within 24 hours after the surgery. The report says longer than that is usually not necessary. It can increase the risk of antibiotic resistance and serious kinds of diarrhea. Not all the news was bad. The report said the rate of pneumonia in adults after surgery decreased more than 11.5%. A separate report looked at the differences last year in health care for different groups in society. Kathleen Sibelius is Secretary of Health and Human Services. Her department produced the 2009 National Healthcare Disparities Report and National Healthcare Quality Report. She noted that racial and ethnic minorities were less likely to have insurance and less likely to get the treatments they needed. She called the numbers troubling. But she also said the health care reforms passed by Congress will improve the quality of care for all Americans. She said the new law will reward quality over quantity of care, creating a system that prevents diseases before more costly treatment is required. And that's the VOA Special English Health Report. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. We recently told you about a study which found that more than 10% of all babies worldwide are born too early. A common problem in preterm babies is respiratory disease. The lungs are the last organs to develop. But a medicine called surfactant can save babies struggling to breathe. The story of this life-saving medicine begins with a discovery in 1959 by a researcher named Mary Ellen Avery. She told this story in 2005 to Children's News at Children's Hospital Boston, where she was the first woman to serve as physician-in-chief. She had been doing research at the Harvard School of Public Health. She was asked to find out more about the foam that forms in the lungs of people with a condition called pulmonary edema. At night, she worked in a hospital delivery room. She saw many premature babies with a disease now called respiratory distress syndrome. She examined the lungs of babies who had died. 
she found there was no air in their lungs, and she discovered why. In her words, the material that was important, the foam, was missing, and they were struggling to reinflate their lungs. Nature put this foam, or surfactant, in the lungs to lower surface tension. You cannot keep air spaces inflated without it. Babies usually develop this coating while they are in the womb, but many premature babies do not. Finally, in 1980, a Japanese doctor, Tetsuro Fujiwara, published a study about an artificial surfactant. It could be given to a baby and within minutes, the baby could breathe. The medical community had taken years to accept Dr. Avery's discovery, but she told Harvard Medical School in 1982 that she never gave up. In her words, knowing what you want to do is important, especially in research. Dr. Ann Hansen at Children's Hospital Boston remembers the first time she heard about Dr. Avery. It was in 1990, when the government was in the process of approving a surfactant called Exosurf. The doctor she was working with had some exciting news for her. She said it was the last night before the hospital would start giving Exosurf to all its preterm babies. And then he told her the story of Mary Ellen Avery. Dr. Avery was 84 years old when she died late last year. For VOA Special English, I'm Mario Ritter. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. For people with HIV, the earlier they start treatment, the better. And better, not just for them. A study has shown that early treatment greatly reduces the risk that the partner of an infected person will also get infected. HIV is the virus that causes AIDS. Dr. Anthony Fauci, is with the United States National Institutes of Health, which paid for the study. He says many studies have been showing that the earlier you start, the better it is for the person who is infected. But this study shows that it is also helps keep that person from transmitting the virus to a heterosexual partner. Most of the couples in the study were heterosexual. So researchers cannot say if the results would be the same in men who have sex with men. The study took place in Botswana, Brazil, India, Kenya, Malawi, South Africa, Thailand, the United States, and Zimbabwe. It involved almost 2,000 couples divided into two groups. In one group, the infected man or woman began to take a combination of three antiretroviral drugs immediately after being found to have HIV. In the other group, the infected partners began drug treatment only when they started to show signs of getting AIDS. The researchers say both groups received equal amounts of HIV-related care and counseling. That included information about safe sex practices, free condoms, and regular HIV testing. The study began in 2005. It was supposed to last until 2015, but researchers stopped it early because the results were so clear. 
only one case of infection was reported in couples where the infected partner began immediate treatment. Dr. Fauci says earlier treatment led to a 96% reduction in the spread of HIV to uninfected partners. He says, this is a powerful bit of evidence that will go into the thinking and formulation of guidelines by the international organizations that help to provide drugs in the developing world. The study shows the value in testing and treating HIV before a person even feels sick enough to see a doctor. But in many countries, public health budgets are already stretched thin. In sub-Saharan Africa, the area hardest hit by AIDS, for every person who gets treated, two others go untreated. Antiretroviral drugs suppress the virus. Once people start treatment, they have to continue it daily for the rest of their life. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Crisuti. You can download MP3s of Special English programs and find English teaching activities at voaspecialenglish.com. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. Loneliness has been linked to depression and other health problems. Now, a study says it can also spread. A friend of a lonely person was 52% more likely to develop feelings of loneliness. And a friend of that friend was 25% more likely to do the same. Earlier findings showed that happiness, obesity, and the ability to stop smoking can also spread, like infections, within social groups. The findings all come from a major health study in the American town of Framingham, Massachusetts. The study began in 1948 to investigate the causes of heart disease. Since then, more tests have been added, including measures of loneliness and depression. The new findings involved more than 5,000 people in the second generation of the Framingham Heart Study. The researchers examined friendship histories and reports of loneliness. The results established a pattern that spread as people reported fewer close friends. For example, loneliness can affect relationships between next door neighbors. The loneliness spreads as neighbors who were close friends now spend less time together. The study also found that loneliness spreads more easily among women than men. Researchers from the University of Chicago, Harvard, and the University of California, San Diego, did the study. The findings appeared in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. The average person is said to experience feelings of loneliness about 48 days a year. The study found that having a lonely friend can add about 17 days. But every additional friend can decrease loneliness by about 5%, or two and a half days. Lonely people become less and less trusting of others. This makes it more and more difficult for them to make friends, and more likely that society will reject them. John Cacciapo at the University of Chicago led the study. He says it is important to recognize and deal with loneliness. He says people who have been pushed to the edges of society should receive help to repair their social networks. The aim should be to aggressively create what he calls 
a protective barrier against loneliness. This barrier, he says, can keep the whole network from coming apart. And that's the VOA Special English Health Report. You can find transcripts and MP3s of all of our reports at voaspecialenglish.com. You can also post your comments and read what others are saying. And you can find us on YouTube and Twitter at VOA Learning English. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. Today, we take another look at teaching young people how to build healthy relationships. Last week, we told you 15% of seventh graders said they had experienced physical violence in a relationship with the opposite sex. Seventh graders are about 12 years old. Concerns about dating abuse at such a young age are leading to new programs to teach 11 to 14 year olds about healthy relationships. The Northwestern state of Idaho has had a program for the last few years called Start Strong Idaho. Director Kelly Miller says healthy relationships depend on open, honest communication. And that starts with communication between children and parents. Ms. Miller advises parents to talk with their children anytime they can. Parent-child communication can reduce the risk of abusive relationships. 75% of students in the study said they talked to their parents about the issue of dating violence. A good time to have a conversation about a difficult issue is during a family meal or after watching a movie or television show together. Kelly Miller says young people need rules and boundaries. They also need the skills to be able to resist pressure to be on the phone all the time or to text when they should be sleeping. The Start Strong Idaho website offers some advice. For instance, watch out for these signs that a phone could be part of an abusive relationship. Feeling like you have to answer text messages or calls right away. Feeling like the texts you receive have gone from caring to controlling. Being pressured to constantly be on your phone even when you are with friends. And being pressured to send sexual texts or pictures. Kelly Miller also tells young people not to write anything on Facebook that they would not want their parents or other family members to see. And she reminds them that there is no need to accept friend requests from strangers or to give your phone number to someone you do not know. Start Strong Idaho holds separate workshops for parents and teens and also brings the two groups together. Kelly Miller says during these meetings, families often learn things they never knew about each other. Ms. Miller said, one mom came up and said, I'm so thankful there was this workshop tonight because I found out my son not only was dating, but currently has two girlfriends at the same time and didn't understand the problem with that. And that's the VOA Special English Health Report. I'm Carolyn Prasuti. From VOA Learning English, this is the Health Report. Human Rights Watch has released a new report called Living in Hell. It documents the practice of pasung in Indonesia. Pasung is when a person 
suffering from mental problems is separated from other people. The person in Pasung is forced to eat, sleep, and stay in one small place. The Human Rights Watch report says about 18,000 people currently live in Pasung in Indonesia. The reports tell of one case in which a man was trapped in a room for 15 years. Another case involved a 24-year-old woman suffering from depression. Photos show her chained to a wooden platform that serves as a bed. Shanta Ru Barige is the director of Human Rights Watch's Disability Rights Division. She says the organization has documented abuse of the mentally sick in many countries. She says mental health problems are often misunderstood. People in Indonesia and other countries do not see mental disorders as medical conditions, she says. Instead, many believe evil spirits cause mental sickness. As a result, people often seek cures from spiritual healers or through prayer. Indonesia banned the practice of Pasung almost 40 years ago. However, Barige says the government has not done enough to end Pasung. Human Rights Watch is calling on Indonesia to enforce the ban. It also says the government should establish a community-based mental health care system. For VOA Learning English, I'm Nikki Strong. From VOA Learning English, welcome to the Health Report in Special English. The Gavi Alliance is a partnership between public health officials and private industry. The group provides vaccines to developing countries. Recently, the Alliance announced plans for an immunization campaign to protect 180,000 girls from cervical cancer. It has chosen eight countries to start administering the vaccine for human papillomavirus, or HPV. Most cervical cancers result from HPV. The virus is passed through sex. Seth Berkeley is chief executive officer of the Gavi Alliance. He says one woman dies every two minutes from cervical cancer. That is more women than die in childbirth. Dr. Berkeley says an estimated 275,000 women die from this cancer each year, and 85% of the victims are in the developing world. He warns that without intervention, the estimate would reach 430,000 deaths a year by 2030. The HPV vaccine is given to girls between the ages of 9 and 13. It is only effective before someone is infected with the virus. If infection does take place, the virus may cause extremely small changes at the cellular level. A pap smear test or pap test can find those changes, but the test may not be available to women in developing countries. If the infection is not found, the cancer begins to grow and will spread. There are signs like bleeding. 
and after the cancer spreads, there is pain. The HPV vaccine will be administered as part of school programs in Laos and seven African countries. The seven are Ghana, Kenya, Madagascar, Malawi, Niger, Sierra Leone, and Tanzania. Dr. Berkeley notes that efforts must be made to reach girls who are not in school. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. From VOA Learning English, this is the Health Report. In the United States, hospitals with the best resources to treat injuries are known as trauma centers. One of the largest is at the Los Angeles County University of Southern California Medical Center. Dr. Dimitrios Dimitriadis is the Director of Trauma Services at the hospital. He says when a trauma team is activated, all the members are expected to be ready within five minutes. This happens before the patient even arrives. Every member of the team has a job to do. Dr. Dimitriadis says this methodical way of treating patients in the trauma center has greatly reduced preventable deaths. Other trauma care changes have also improved survival rates. One change involves emergency medical technicians and paramedics. These first responders are often with local fire and rescue departments. They can start treatment in the field while communicating with doctors at the hospital. But Dr. Dimitriadis says the thinking now is to avoid any delays in transporting seriously injured patients. The new policy is known as scoop and run. Another change is that the hospital does not always operate on patients with gunshots to the abdomen. Avoiding surgery reduces the risk of infection and other problems. Some lessons in trauma care have come from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Dr. Dimitriadis says one lesson is to not give trauma patients large amounts of saline and other intravenous fluids. Patients are given fresh blood products instead. Changes like these have improved the chances of survival in trauma centers by as much as 25 percent. For VOA Learning English, I'm Mario Ritter.